And so now I'd like to invite Sandy Blair for a retirement readiness update. Okay, I just wanted to reiterate what Mia said about the expressly authorized language. If you guys do have questions about it, we're always happy to take things on a case-by-case -case basis, but please do watch the May um, EAC because I think it'll answer a lot of your questions. We went in very in-depth on what the definition is and what we consider ex expressly authorized. So, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sandy Blair, I'm the director of our Retirement Readiness Division, and we are the division that does all the member outreach and education. Um, so I'm just gonna update you guys on some of the things we've been up to. I know um, probably a year or so ago came and talked to you all about the launch of our onboarding pilot. So I wanna give you an update on where we are. So one of the initiatives of the CalSTR strategic and business plan is to onboard new educators. And so I think, I don't know how many of you were here, but um, I showed a new video about our new educator video. I have it here today. For those of you who don't remember, I'm happy to show it again. Um, and part of this pilot launch is really getting into new teacher orientations, onboarding platforms, um, really a partnership with um, all of you as the employers. But we've partnered with EdJoin. So through that recruitment platform, EdJoin is also launching an onboarding platform. Through that onboarding platform, they're gonna house some CalSTRS educational videos, um, as well as those um, individuals. So your counterparts, or maybe some of you who do um, the new hire orientations, a component of that can be to go online and learn about their defined benefit pension. We feel that um, in working with also the California Department of Education, Tony Thurman's, one of his main platforms is talking about teacher recruitment and retention, um, really looking at um, what the future holds for teacher shortages throughout the state and how we can maybe you know help facilitate not only the hiring and people going into the teaching profession, but also the retention of those who have started working and might only last two, three, five years and, and exit that profession. And we feel that a way to partner with that is really talking about the value of a defined benefit pension. And if they can understand that early, that they have a CalSTRS defined benefit pension for their retirement future. We're hoping that that can help with the recruitment efforts as well as the retention efforts for all of you as employers. And then we're also partnering with um, the California Teacher Credentialing where they are going out and handing out some brochures that CalSTRS has done really at those college campuses and um, again, working on those recruitment type efforts. Um, there's a list of um, a few of the pilot districts that we've worked with in these efforts. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, and we continue to um, embrace partnerships with other districts. So if any of you are interested in working with us, I'm going to kind of go through what that looks like. Um, I'd be happy to have you email me and we will get in touch and um, roll this out because we're working on more and more in the upcoming school years. So what we've developed is currently we have um, six modules developed. Um, we have them located on a back page of the calsters.com, which we will be giving out um, in these upcoming months with these pilot districts, um, the links and stuff to get to that back page. And what we've done is we've created educational modules for you all to use because we would love to be there all the time, um, but we have limited resources as well. So we wanna partner and give you all tools to use, um, not only in onboarding, but ongoing efforts as your uh, employees have questions. So this is a sample of a lesson plan. So really, um, this is our welcome to CalSTRS module. So this is the initial onboarding module that we're using. Um, it, in, encompasses using this benefit of a lifetime brochure that talks about a defined benefit pension. Um, so that's kind of the outside piece. And then on the inside, um, there is a QR code 
that takes the individuals to the new educator page. So we've actually developed four career stage pages on calsters.com that has more appropriate things that are targeted directly for that new educator, the mid-career, the nearing retirement, and our retired educator. So there's videos and resources you know, that directs them at that career stage of things and action steps that they can take. So part of this lesson plan that we've been having some of our pilot participants do is we're providing them with these brochures. Um, they will direct the individual to take their smartphone, scan the QR code. It takes them to that new educator page. We have within that lesson plan some of the talking points because within this phone, um, there's action steps and things they need to know and do. And then in addition to that, it's actually showing this video. So each of the modules of the six that we've developed so far, and we are continuing to partner and develop additional ones, have a video, some kind of interactive component with some publication, again, engaging that educator to their CalSTRS so that they can learn about their defined benefit pension, that they can take action, whether that's completing their one-time death benefit form and getting that on file, um, uh, welcome their MyCalSTRS, going online, getting their MyCalSTRS account established. Um, do you guys want to watch the video? Okay, how do I do that? Can I do that? Can I click on it? No? Go to the dot com. Sorry, thanks, Dan. You guys don't mind. Is the temperature too cold in here? Too hot in here? Anyone? Cold? Some people are too warm and some people are too cold. Okay, then we'll we'll just have to leave it as it is. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why the sound's not working. Okay, we'll try this. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I probably should have warned you. It's okay. 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 Maybe now it'll work. I know. This. Yeah. So Calsters is a retirement company, a retirement place. Yeah. As far as I know, they manage the teachers' retirements. Which part? I don't know. Just getting hired, I'm kind of getting used to that and getting into that. I think that they help me with my retirement plan. Welcome to the California State Teachers Retirement System, better known as CalSTRS. Don't worry if you're not sure what CalSTRS is or what we do. That's why we created this short video. Hi, I'm Jenna, an educator from Central California. When I first started teaching, I wasn't sure what CalSTRS was either. Put simply, we're your retirement plan. We provide retirement benefits to California's public school educators and their beneficiaries. 
As a new teacher, I know you're busy helping to build your students' futures, but it's just as important to focus on your future, even this early in your career. Your income in retirement is a shared responsibility between CalSTRS and you. As a CalSTRS member, you belong to a hybrid retirement system consisting of three benefit programs. First, there's the Defined Benefit Program, which provides your primary retirement benefit or pension. This is a guaranteed lifetime monthly benefit based on a formula, not on the ups and downs of the investment markets or the amount of money you contribute. The formula is simple. It's based on your years of service, your age at retirement, and your final compensation. Each month, you and your employer contribute a percentage of your pay toward your retirement benefits. Your paycheck statement shows exactly how much you're contributing. The second piece of the CalSTRS hybrid system is the Defined Benefit Supplement Program. This is a separate account that provides additional income for your retirement. The funds in this account come from your contributions and your employer's contributions on your earnings in excess of one year of service credit. For example, you may take on an outgrowth or extra pay assignment in addition to your regular full-time work schedule, such as a coach or yearbook advisor. The contributions in this account earn interest at a guaranteed rate and you receive all the funds in this account at retirement. You're automatically enrolled in both of these first two programs as a CalSTRS member. The third part of your CalSTRS retirement plan is a voluntary defined contribution plan that lets you set aside additional money in a 403B or 457B investment plan. The reason this third part is so critical is that the median CalSTRS retirement benefit will only replace about half of your salary. A supplemental savings plan can help you close any gap between your CalSTRS benefit and your retirement income goal. You contribute to these accounts through payroll deductions that you set up through your employer. You decide how much you want to contribute each month. The best place to search for the right supplemental savings plan is 403bcompare.com. 403B Compare is an online resource of free, objective information explaining the plans offered in California. It gives you an easy and transparent way to compare investment fees, performance, and services. CalSTRS also provides disability and survivor benefits, but we do not provide health benefits. Also, as a CalSTRS member, you don't contribute to Social Security, so you will not receive Social Security benefits for your CalSTRS covered employment. If you have it already, activate your My CalSTRS account, the online secure portal for all your accounts. Be sure to review your annual retirement progress report each September. It provides a summary of your service credit and your contributions and interest. Also visit calsters.com regularly where you'll find publications and videos that dig deeper into the topics we've outlined here. Take it from me, even as a young teacher, you want to stay informed and engaged with Calsters. Your future self will thank you. I don't like standing behind these things, but I don't want you to hear me. So that's a component of like the first module. And so we've had partners, not only those school districts, but also some union representatives when they're doing their onboarding piece pilot, this new onboarding module, as well as we have done it when we've been invited to attend um, new teacher orientation days and events. So. Um, these are some of the other ones that we have available that we will be launching that's on that back page of our .com that provides resources to um, HR representatives. So for example, um, the understanding the formula, the gap, survivor benefits. Um, we also have a purchasing service credit module. So like if you have someone who was to come in and be asking for maternity or leave papers. That might be something, a resource that you would want to share with them. Um, some of our partners are also doing it throughout the year in immersion programs. So they're taking a module like this every couple months when they're having in-service days or these immersion meetings with their new teachers and sharing this information. Again, keeping them engaged and educating them around their um, defined benefit pension. Um, 
So any questions on that? I would like to offer you that any of your partners, I mean, some of you may not do these activities specifically, but if your counterparts at the school districts would want to partner with us, um, please, you know, have them get in touch with, with me or um, the Retirement Readiness Division, um, and we will reach out to them and provide these tools and resources. So where we're going from this now is within those pilot districts, we are um, over the next couple months touching back with them. We're getting um, feedback, um, basically data points and numbers, how many new teachers and educators they engage, how they're continuing to use these resources in this pilot um, time. And then again, like I said, the more partners, ideally we would like 100% of all the school districts using these and incorporating these tools and educational um, resources with all of your um, new employees that our CalSTRS covered. So another thing that we do is every year um, in July, we've kind of found a sweet spot in July is we host financial awareness days. Um, this is just the days that we did last year. Our attendance continues to grow at all of our member service centers. And um, we're very excited to offer um, these one day events that we kind of cycle throughout the state. Um, again, it's education for all members of CalSTRS. And then we have been doing, this is the third year that we've done new educator days. Um, those are in October, held on Saturdays. We really market towards those individuals between that two and five years of service credit, um, really trying to get them in to understand their defined benefits. So the workshops and things that we do at this event is really geared towards new educators around their CalSTRS benefit. And then for the first time this year, we've um, had an initiative to reach out to our retired members. We haven't traditionally done a lot of outreach and efforts to our retired community. Um, you all know they get their check every month and they're happy with that, but there's, I think, more that we can do. So for the first time this year, we hosted, and we still have um, two more in our Glendale Member Center and Riverside Member Center coming up on Friday, Retired Educator Day. This is a copy of the new member kit. Um, so this went out for the first time in October to our new retirees, and they will continue to go out every year after in October, after everyone has retired for that year. And really it's a resource for them to um, things that they can do in their retirement actions. Again, engaging them with their MyCalsters, some of the online tools that are available for them to use in retirement and engagement opportunities with CalSTRS and things that they need to know, such as maybe working after retirement, and what that looks like for them as a retired educator. So we're really um, proud to be launching these services to our retired members. So keep that in mind. And then with that, that's kind of my update about the outreach and education efforts that we're doing in retirement readiness. You guys have any questions, mm -hmm. comments? Okay, and then I just, again, another plug, if your counterparts um, or any of you are interested in reaching out around the onboarding pieces, um, they can send an email to the, what is it, the EIC advisory? Yep, EAC advisory. Um, box would work also external affairs at calsters.com, and we can, um, through external affairs, we can connect um, those that are interested in, in Sandy and her team coming out and uh, offering support and services to members and your employees. Sorry, the email is advisory committee at calsters.com. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Great, thanks Sandy. Um, the other thing I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention while we were talking about um, member access to CalSTRS and CalSTRS benefits, um, we also have a publication. I've got, um, I've got a stack here if folks are interested. If you guys have internet websites and wanted to add a CalSTRS button or a widget or a digital badge, I think any of those terms are kind of the same thing. It would be a CalSTRS logo that would allow your employees to go directly to CalSTRS, access mycalsters.com, access the information, whether it's our publications or our forms. It's just a way for 
us to collaborate with you to make sure that the membership gets the services that they need, that the burden isn't all on you guys to help your employees find that information. We at CalSTRS want to be a resource to you. Um, if that's a, a way to provide better service, answer questions to the members directly. So we've got this. It's got a cute little QR code in the back, which would help the IT staff just um, figure out how to quickly launch and um, deploy that um, digital widget on your internet sites. So with that, we're going to move to Cassie, um, and we're going to do um, crediting of contributions. This is a conversation that we've been having for a year. Um, and change is, um, I know you guys have gone through a lot of change, not only um, with us at CalSTRS, but there's also changes um, at CalPERS. And we know that um, the differences between the two systems can be very frustrating. Um, but we are hoping that with um, Cassie's presentation today, it gives you better insight into the tool that we've been developing with your feedback from these conversations and meetings, um, in addition to other meetings that Cassie and our team has been having about um, how we need to handle crediting of contributions going forward. Um, so with that, I think we're going to, um, our plan is to start this in January. Um, but again, I would just, you know, please keep an open mind as to what the tool looks like. Um, and um, let's take it away, Cassie. Hello, everyone. I'm Cassie. I have with me today Curtis Rogers. Many of you guys know Curtis. He's been assisting employers for the last couple years, so I know this is a familiar face. Um, we're excited today because, like Diane said, we've been talking about this from a conceptual basis the last few times, but today we have the ability to share with you what uh, we've built and what we'll be utilizing and really uh, rolling out to you guys as a resource. So... Um, we're going to start off with talking about what's not changing. Um, we're going to go into a tour, which Curtis is going to assist me with, on our account management tab. That is the tab that uh, employers will be utilizing. Um, we're also going to talk about a few other resources that we've built into this, um, a monthly statement. Uh, we're going to provide notifications that could be daily, depending on the activity of your account. And we've made some enhancements to our variance reports as well and some additional resources that we'll be providing um, to you with this effort. What's not changing is you guys will still be submitting your files through so. That process is not going to change. Um, you will still be remitting your payments the way that you are currently remitting your payments. That process is not changing as well. Really what's changing is this new tab, this portal that we have built. Um, that really provides you with more resources, your ability to really manage the account yourself, and us not refunding contributions back, except for return of excess. We're still refunding return of excess, as we promised. Mm -hmm. Nothing's changing with that. Um, it's really on the contributions and penalties and interest. So Curtis is going to do a walkthrough in a couple uh, minutes. What we're going to show you is how you can view your account. You can look at open items, closed items, um, how you can associate payments yourself. Um, we've built in a functionality where you can disassociate a payment. So let's say you wanted to, you thought you wanted to associate certain payments to a file and then you've decided this is not how I want to do things. Um, if you change within that day, you can disassociate and basically start over. Um, you can view, let's see what else, you can view invoices. So we know you can currently view invoices, but we've kind of built a one-stop shop for you guys. Uh, we've also built in um, visibility for how long you have to do something with a payment. I know we talked about in the past that there will be um, a system time frame to where if a payment is sitting on our account and hasn't been associated. Um, we talked in the past about a 60-day time frame. We got a lot of feedback from you guys that you wanted longer, so we've been able to move that to 90 days. And we've built in a tool for you to um, basically have a countdown to see how long your payment's been sitting there for and if it would be potentially in a position where the system would pick it up and automate it. So I'm going to kick it off to <laughs> Curtis, and he's going to do a walkthrough of our um, account management portal. Do you want to click? Okay. You want to click? Okay. How's everyone doing? Um, this is a look of our new account management tab. 
uh, within this tab, if I can get you guys to focus on the top portion. Um, within this portion, you'll be able to switch between programs, so you can switch between the defined benefit program as well as the cash balance program. Um, you will also be able to switch between transaction types, so you can see just the closed transactions, you can look at open transactions, or you can look at all. Um, currently, you can utilize this portal for two months, so um, you can use the dates for two months. So if you, but if you look at um, all items, it will pull up all items for you, um, regardless of the time frame. And on this side, uh, if we can focus on uh, the bottom portion of the portal. Um, in this portion, on the left-hand side, we have, um, we have where you can associate the payments. So in this portion, you can, so you'd be able to select, okay. you would be able to select uh, the associate tab. Oops, you go back. Sorry. You'd be able to associate the, um, click the ones that you would like to associate. So for instance, you would select uh, one cash payment or two cash payments in a file, for example. And we have the transaction date, which will reflect the date that the file was uploaded, um, as well as the date that we received the payment. Uh, the transaction type and the description will uh, better describe what we are referring to as the receivable or the payment. Uh, the balance column is, so we'll, I'll start with the original. So the original column is gonna reflect the original amount that we received or the original amount due for a file. And once a payment has been applied, um, you will see the actual current balance in the balance amount column. Um, you will see the file identifier under the media ID to help you identify uh, which file this is referring to. We have the PDF column, and in this column is where you will be able to uh, select the invoice to uh, get additional information regarding the receivable. Um, and then we have the days until auto clearing. Uh, so at the last meeting, we received a lot of feedback that you guys wanted uh, it to be clear on before a payment was applied to something. So we created this countdown. So basically um, you will have until it says zero um, before the payment will be automatically applied. And this is showing an example of the invoice. So right in the portal, you will be able to um, actually click on the PDF document to view the invoice. So you will no longer have to go um, switch through multiple tabs to see the, the different invoices. Um, the only caveat to this is you will still have to go to the invoices and the notices tab to see the, um, the invoice detail report. Uh, in this screenshot is an example. It's an example of us associating a payment. Um, so if you would look at the box in red, it has a, a file selected as well as two payments. So this could represent uh, the 95% payment as well as the remaining 5% balance that's being associated to a file. And once you have checked all three boxes, at that time you would hit associate. Once you hit associate, it's gonna ask you, are you sure you want to associate? And at this time is when you would hit select yes if you would like to continue, or you can hit no, and no action would be taken at this time. Um, so after you have clicked associate and these have associated, you'll actually be able to click on the associated totals tab on the bottom right hand corner and it'll actually show you everything that is going to be associated uh, at the end of that night. And if you're looking at the bottom, the, uh, the negative to 12,000, that's re representing the remaining balance on the payment. Um, so if you were to look at the, if you were to quickly just look at the payments, um, there would be an overpayment of about 12,000. And so this is what the bottom um, balance is, is showing you. Um, and then on this next tab, um, we're gonna focus on the document number. And um, I actually just learned this in one of my trainings this week, but if it's blue, it's a clue. So if you <laughs> click on it, <laughs> so if you click on it, you'll be able to actually get additional information on the receivable or the payment. So you can see, Actually, once you click on it, you'll be able to see what all the payment has been applied to, as well as the remaining balance on that payment. And then it's still blue, so we have another clue. So if we click on that, we also will see uh, the file, and we will see all payments that have been applied to that file. 
And so in this instance, we have the file and we have uh, two payments that have been to this, applied to this file and there's uh, no remaining balance on this file at this time. And uh, to show you guys, this is showing you guys the disassociate function. Um, so in this selection, we have selected the, a cash payment as well as a, fi a contribution file. And um, so we're saying, do you want to disassociate? We're gonna say yes. So in this case, you would use this function if, for instance, in the morning time, um, you decided to associate a payment in the file, but for whatever reason, um, you no longer want that to take place at the end of the day, then uh, you would use this function to, to unassociate or disassociate the payment in the file. And on this tab, we actually have created another function for you guys, which is search the media ID. So on this tab, if you're looking for a specific media ID, you no longer have to search through multiple things. You actually can go straight to this tab, type in that media ID, and it'll pull up um, the correspondings that, that happened to with that media file. So it'll have the payment as well as um, the amount of the file due. And uh, for our, so we have some upgrades to our CAP reports, the contribution account portal reports. Uh, so we recently did an upgrade to the portal um, that should help a lot of employers. We received quite a bit of feedback um, that actually has helped Im improve performance. Um, it has also um, get rid of uh, Java issues that we have had in the past, as well as other messages like report not generated. Um, so these things should be fixed now at this time. Uh, we also have um, come up with a new monthly statement. So it will contain um, basically the beginning balance, which will reflect the ending balance of the prior month, and it'll carry all the activities that took place throughout that month. We also have a new daily notification, and on this daily notification, um, you will only receive it if action took place on the account, but uh, you will receive a notification that says if you received um, excess contributions, if you have a payment on file that we received, or if you uploaded a file. Uh, we also have updated the cash variance report to show additional information. Uh, we, we are uh, going to reflect the uh, code four payments or the, the buyback payments on this report as an upgrade. And another upgrade to one of the reports is the variance detail report. Um, I received a lot of feedback from employers that they wanted the employer reported portion that was reflected on the SO reports originally. Um, so we were able to uh, pre-populate that field for you guys, repopulate that field for you guys. Um, so it now will also be reflected on this variance detail report as well. Thank you, Curtis. Um, I, okay, I'm going to take over from here and show you a couple examples of some of the features that we discussed. Uh, this is a screenshot of the monthly statement. So again, like Curtis said, this is really going to show your activity for the month, your beginning balance, um, anything that you really did in that month. You associated a payment, you remitted um, money to us, a file, and then your ending balance. This will get sent to you, I believe electronically, correct, right. on a monthly basis as well as our uh, email notification. So I know a lot of times staff get questions on, did you receive this payment? Um, how come this hasn't been associated to this? Have you seen my file and things like that? So we built in this notification to, to provide this information to you. So when you remit a payment and a payment is received by CalSTRS, you would get this uh, notification to say payment has been received or if a file has been transmitted. Um, or if you've associated something, you will get this um, notification, as well as if an invoice is generated. Let's say your file processed, you payment, you uh, associated your payment, and then PNI ran. So, so like Curtis said, you will only get this if there's activity on your account. If you haven't done anything in a couple days, you're not going to receive just a blank uh, notification. It's only if something has occurred. Again, this will be... Um, auto-generated through email notification through just how the other notifications come through within CAP. And additional resources. So part of what we're doing to roll this out is we will have an employer directive available. Uh, we're putting together employer guides, kind of a walkthrough job aid, so you have screenshots of what functionality and how it works. 
Uh, we put together a frequently asked question. So the questions that have come up from you guys through all these avenues or things that we think maybe we'll get asked um, to try to help, we'll have that. Um, we're putting an Employer Connect article out that will be coming out in January, as well as we're going to host some webinars in January, some live webinars to do, again, a walkthrough. We feel like once we roll this functionality out, there'll probably be more questions. So we will um, put some webinars out there on so to walk you guys through it. We really want to support you guys through this transition. So um, we're trying to hit kind of every avenue we can think of from a resource stance to provide to you. Uh, like Diane said, we're hoping to uh, implement this in January of 2020, and we are open to any questions you may have for us. Dina from Orange County. The monthly statement that you just showed so every July, it will start with a zero balance or balance from previous year? It's a rolling balance, right? Yeah, it'd be a it'll be a rolling, rolling balance. balance. It will be a rolling balance? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Good question. Thank you. Now when we send our final monthly file, we associate the payments, you know, when we do the final posting, so we'll no longer associate the payments. That's a very good question. File. So you're talking about on the SO portal, you have the ability. That ability is still there. You can still, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this is my subject matter expert to keep me honest here. Um, you still have that ability to associate payments on the portal in SO. However, you have more functionality in the tab to, um, to manage your account. But you can continue to do it that way if you want to, or you can log into this portal and you can associate your payments there. Like some of the functionality, like disassociate, that's not going to live in the SO portal. It's, it's strictly um, whatever functionality is currently there will remain there. So I think our hope is hopefully everybody will move to the CAP portal because that's where we've kind of built more efficiencies. But it's still there. It's still going to work the same way. Thank you for that question. Just to add, um, <clears throat> the only difference is uh, currently in today's world, when you upload the file, that is the only time that you have to associate a payment. So in the new world, we will be able to associate that payment at any time. So if you upload that file today and there's a remaining balance and you say, hey, there's a credit on my account at any time that you would like, you can go in there and apply that credit as well. Question. What will happen if there's a payment and then the number of days is zero? Will there be a refund issued or how? Do you want to take No, the uh, payment would actually be automatically applied. Um, so the payment would automatically be applied to contributions first. And after contributions, if there's an excess contribution receivable, it would be applied to that receivable next. And then after that, it would be p and I. If there's something that if there is something that's left open on the account. If there's nothing left open, it's going to sit there until you basically have more activity on your account. Did you have your, did you have one question? One more question. I think Bina had a follow-up. Bina from Orange County. I haven't done this piece by myself. So I'm just trying to understand the association of the file. So once we submit, we, when we issue our first payment, by the fifth business day, we don't have a file to associate. And then by the 15th business day, we have the file mm -hmm. to associate with. So I can go back to the fifth payment and associate that file with that as well? Yes, ma'am. Is that what you mean? Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Any more questions? We have our contact I, information. I'm whoa, sorry. whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. <laughs> oh, not Stanislaus. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. With, with Mina's question, it just brought up something. So I was asking um, my coworker. So if if my if I have one that's at zero, uh -huh. and then I have a file and I upload, and it's ready to go, and I pay, apply a payment dollar for dollar, will it still apply your 
No, not if you associate the payment at the time of upload. So it'll just wait for one that's short and auto-apply it? Exactly. Okay, all right. Good question, thank you. We do have our contact information at the bottom, so if you have any questions or concerns, um, please feel free to contact us. And like I said, please look out for those resources. They'll be posted in the normal place and uh, on so under reference items. There'll be uh, announcements out there as well to let you know that these are going on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. oh sorry. Oh, we have one more question. Sorry, one more. Okay, the excess DBS that we get, we get a check for those. We're no longer going to get a check for that? You are still going to receive a check for the excess contributions? Correct. You will still be receiving checks for those. Okay. And please announce your name in the name of your employer. No? It's not there. Oh, oh it's Dennis. <laughs> Just to confirm our understanding, so if we have a bunch of payments and then we posted a file and the payments is greater than the file, there will be like a balance, right, on our account, and then whenever we post another file, it can go towards that balance? Correct. Okay. And, and when you upload that next file, you can also select that credit as well when you're uploading that file in so, so you'll still be able to use that as well in so as well. So in a sense, that's kind of a splitting... A payment. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Which right. we, we can't really to do in today's process. We don't really do in today's process. So we've built that functionality in in the future that that should not be an issue. You can split payments how you would like to split payments. Okay. So we're questioning if I upload, you know how right now you have the threshold, right? So let's mm -hmm. say I have you know, $500 available, it's at zero, right? Okay. And I upload my next file and I'm $5 short. Is it gonna take $5 from my credit balance to make that zero or is there still gonna be that threshold that it won't take that from? No, it's, it's gonna uh, use the credit for that remaining $5. It's not gonna... So it's gonna be dollar for dollar, no more threshold. Yes. Is what that you, the same on... What does she mean by she's thinking the 9 The 9, nine, nine. nine. Oh, oh, is what oh, she's talking about. I'm sorry, about. I wasn't following what you meant by the threshold. I got it. So is it going to be the same for P&I then? If there's a P&I that's less than 999, are you guys going to pull from our money sitting there? I need that to get I'm back to you sure. on that one. On the contributions, 100% sure, yes. We're, we're not going to be writing off pennies or anything like that. It would be like your um, situation uh, that you just said. If, if you were short that $5, it'll take that $5. I need to get back to you on the P&I clarification so I can get back to I'll get back to everyone on that. Okay, so then one more question. You had a slide up there that showed a balance of 12000 at the bottom, right? Yes. So because we're going to have all these carryover balances and they come from different accounts and such, is there going to be a way to reverse that, meaning go into the payment that I made of 10000 and see exactly which STMs that that 10000 that particular yes. 10000 applied for? Yeah. So the same thing that you had up there but reverse based on payment, correct? We have it for payment and file. So you can payment look to file. see... Okay what that payment applied to, or you can look at it from the file perspective of what payments applied to that file. He, he, okay. He'll walk you through it. Yeah, and in this example right here on this screenshot, um, it's showing what all the payment was applied to. So in this case, the payment was only applied to one file, which is the STM 22640. And uh, after being applied to that file, there's still a $12,000 balance remaining. And so if you were to apply this 12,000 to another file, uh, once that was associated in the nightly job brand, then the next day you could come in and see both files have been associated with this payment. Um, just a question on that one day, within one day. You, is, so then, for example, if I associate a payment and then I, um, I want to make a change the following day, that's too late? To the is that correct? Yes, that's correct. You have until 5 p.m. Um, of the same day to change it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. 
It looks Thank like you guys. All right. Thank you, Cassie and Curtis. Okay. So um, that brings us to the end of our agenda. So open forum before we get to announcements. Anyone have any topic? Let's wait for a microphone. Hi, Robin Wood, Contra Costa County. So we've been experiencing an issue internally, and this is kind of ongoing uh, as far as CalSTRS members, retirees, coming back as independent contractors or their desire to come back as independent contractors. And most of uh, the CalSTRS retirees are teachers, and they're coming back in somewhat of a teaching capacity. Maybe they're doing mentor teacher work, kind of hard to fill positions. And it's been kind of, a, as far as the district payroll services, it's been our opinion that they should come back as employees as opposed to independent contractors. So I'm kind of wondering, as far as CalSTRS is concerned, should they come back as independent contractors? Can they or should they be coming back as, as an employee? Samantha from Member Account Services coming up. Hello, Samantha from Mass. Um, so that's an employment issue. That's not something that we get involved in. That's up to you guys. Um, there are rules, obviously, for bringing back retired people. So um, it's up to you. We're not going to get involved and tell you what to do one way or the other because that's not our place. What about the reporting? Yeah, so if they're act retired member activities, then they need to be reported to us. Is that what you're, okay, yes. So even if they're classified as independent contractor or if they're classified as employees, if they're retired, um, CalSTRS members doing retired member activities, they need to be reported to CalSTRS. Yes, I, I would okay. Agree okay. <laughs> I'm just not sure whether a teacher should be coming back to a teaching organization as a CalSTRS member as an independent yeah, we don't have an opinion on that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's an employment issue. I have a question, um, and it has to do with the retirees. So I got a phone call from a STRS retiree, and she wants to see if she can come back to work at the County Office of Education in a classified position. And she's saying, I'm not going to be working as a classified employee in a school district, so am I exempt from the earnings limitation? Is it allowed? That's a good one. I know. Nicole's not here today. Yeah. But we Sorry, have Nicole is, is sick today, so <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Um, so, okay. okay. <laughs> So if you're if you retired from a school, um, you can't come back to work as a, in a classified capacity. I'm sorry, unless you're unless you're legislative aid or, or I'm sorry, not a legislative aid, an educational instructional aid. Thank you. Right. Correct. Yes. If you're if you're retired from CalSTRS, but you go. I'm sorry, I'm getting super confused. <laughs> okay, we're retired. I need Pam. Pam, come help. Um, okay, okay, perfect. So, <laughs> Department of Education, uh, they have a waiver. I don't know how to get it, but there is a waiver that the person can get so they can work in a, another classified assignment. As far as earning limitation, whenever 
to my understanding, they do a classified job. The earning, they are not doing creditable service. Then earning limitations don't apply. But just like other resolutions and all are done, it's the same way Department of Education, they have, people can get a waiver for, to do another kind of position. Oh. But I haven't personally done it. I just, it was mentioned in one of the... So who knows about the waiver? <clears throat> So the State Board of Education has broad authority to waive any section of the education code yeah. unless it says that they cannot waive those sections of the education code. I'm not sure. It sounds like that the code section we're referring to that limits classified service for CalSTRS retirees uh, may not uh, be subject to an exemption from that, so it may be able to be waived. But for example, all of CalSTRS law, so all of the teacher's retirement law, cannot be waived by the State Board of Education. So there's a laundry list of things that cannot be waived. Maybe the section can be. Yeah, I, I had received an email from one of the meetings that there is a waiver that can be done for that. But I have personally never done it. So. And I have no idea how likely the State Board of Education is to grant those waivers and to which sections of the education code. Yeah. Selena, for uh, clarification, were you saying that the employee that you're referring to was a classified employee? No, she was a certificated employee. Okay. She was doing cert certificated, certificated trying to go work, to work, retired. And, and just to add more to this, she said she called the STRS hotline and they said it's perfectly okay to be hired and to apply for a classified position in the county office because she's not in a school setting doing credible service. So that's why I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> as, as far as I know, it doesn't matter whether it's a county office of ed or a district. What we were told is a STRS member, STRS retiree can only come back in a classified position two ways. One as a one-on-one -on -one aide in a uh, classroom or in a classroom with a high student to teacher ratio. Those are the only two ways. Now, they can become a CalPERS member. If they're working enough hours to qualify for CalPERS membership, they can be a CalPERS member. But they can only do those two positions because they're a STRS retiree. We would concur with that. And as far as the contact center, we can follow up and make sure that everybody's getting the correct information. So um, one of the groups I belong to that Vina's mentioned about getting the notices sent around was about the ed code that limits us or CalSTRS member at retirement to work in the classified position. I believe that there's a, one of the directives that you send out every year states that ed code in the directive. In past directives that said that CDE did control that um, ed code, that your are responsibility as Cal CalSTRS responsibility was to notify us of that ed code. And then there are employers who have went to CDE and found that there is an exemption process where you'd have to do a board resolution. And I believe that has to be done annually. It's not just a one time and you can work forever. You have to redo it every year for every position that they work in. Any other questions? Um, I just needed uh, clarification. Um, you know, access contributions for DBS, how it takes stirs almost one year to figure it out, and then they refund the money, uh, millions of dollars. And then um, once we receive the money, it takes us little time to give that refund the employees. Are you aware of if there is any legal, like a time frame that within so many months or days, we have to refund the employee because it's their money, we cannot hold it. So I just wanted to know if there are any guidelines or any time frame. Cassie, can you help with that? Oh, thank I don't you, think Joyce. there's a time frame in the law, but the money has to be returned. I'm sorry. Can you I don't think there's a time frame in the law. I think it's section 22905. I wish I had my law book. Um, but I, there's no time frame. It just has to be returned. Okay. 
Okay, and I have one other. Um, this morning we were I had a meeting with PERS, and they were talking about right of election, like how um, right of election only applies to that position. Let's say they have a teacher has ten month teacher has accepted uh, per, selected PERS as their retirement system. So whenever on the STIR side, teachers who are, for example, less than full time, and they have these other outgrowth activities or something, can we report the outgrowth activity to STIRs if, if they make an election for regular position to PERS? Let's say a uh, less than 50% contract person who has a outgrowth activity and they elected PERS as their retirement system. The outgrowth activity, because the election wasn't done and it's not creditable service, can that be reported to STIRS? They have to be a CalSTRS member performing CalSTRS credible service of some of the duties that are listed in credible service before outgrowth can come to us. So the situation you're explaining where a CalPERS member and they have some kind of outstanding I mean, outgrowth activities that cannot come to no, CalSTRS. They are Cal's, I mean, they are a teacher, but they elected CalPERS as their retirement mm, system. No. Okay. If they're yeah, a CalSTRS yeah. member, then outgrowth activities related to the instructional program can come to CalSTRS. If they're CalPERS, it cannot come to CalSTRS. Right. If they're a CalPERS member, they have to follow CalPERS rules. So that would not be creditable. Correct. But can the position pay go to PERS because they elected by the 372 and the outgrowth go to STRS? Right? Please, please use the microphone. We have uh, remote members of the audience. I think you're asking, so if you have a teacher who elected CalPERS for their certificate work, but they are also a CalSTRS member, but they elected PERS for their teaching position, CalPERS says that, you know, the teaching position could, could go to PERS, the outgrowth cannot go to PERS, can that outgrowth go to STRS? If they have prior service, but they're not performing CalSTRS service at that time, I'm getting head No, they the cannot. But they are prefer performing CalSTRS service. They're they it's for it CalPERS, so you have to follow the CalPERS rules. So I, to, you know, I don't think that they allow additional service to come in in addition to the main position. So for example, the easy, of course, situation is full-time. So if they elected CalPERS for the full-time position, they don't accept anything over a year of service credit. It doesn't matter what, whether it's outgrowth or not. But. And I'd like to add that, remember, the retirement system election is by position. So if that person in that position elects CalPERS, anything that they do now, right, it's, it's subject to CalPERS. But let's say they take another position, another school district, um, or at your school district, and they don't elect that same CalPERS coverage if they're doing a concurrent retirement, maybe then that outgrowth could be reported to STRS. But that outgrowth isn't creditable on its own. And so you're looking at it like it's by itself. So it can't come to CalSTRS. Does that help clarify? Summer school teaching is considered creditable service. So if it's less than full time, they can permissively elect, or if they mandate in for the thresholds, that's what we're looking at. But if they're just a CalPERS member and then they're performing summer school, it's up to CalPERS. So that's the same kind of service that they've elected in for their main position. So I don't know what the CalPERS rules are for adding up to 100% of time or, or going, they definitely don't take more than you know one year of service credit. So it's CalPERS rules at that point in time. And to clarify, summer school is not outgrowth. It, it is a creditable, creditable service on its own. Thank you. So I had a piggy, piggy get back question on that. If you have someone who elected PERS for their teaching position, but then they're hired into a part-time say a tutoring, which is creditable all on its own position. No. That, Are you a charter school? No. So tutoring would not be creditable on its own. So it would, if I hired someone, because I can hire them to do the after school, a teacher to come in and teach in the after school program as a tutor, that's not creditable all on its own? No. Outgrowth. That would no. be outgrowth. That would be outgrowth. That's credible as outgrowth. A tutor doesn't require a CTC credential, 
So um, that would be why it would not be considered a credible service activity on its own. If you're saying that they're working as a teacher and requiring that CTC credential, um, and you want to send us that duty statement, we can review that. But a so tutor typically doing intervention. So the children are required to go to the additional program, and it's a credentialed teacher that has to teach the class. I think we'd need to look at that duty statement a little further. If you'd want to send that on to um, employer help at um, we can review that, that case and answer specifically to that. Hi, Anne with Livermore Valley. Um, on the circular included in our packet on mandate of electronic funds payments, does that include buybacks? Buybacks, service credit buybacks? I don't know. We will have to. The EFT is for contributions. It requires electronic funds transfers for contributions. OK. So are you including the service credit buybacks in that definition? What is the service credit buyback? A four. An employee is making a contribution towards buying back service. I'm not familiar with that. We can. Um, I know that is a um, that is FSB. So we've been talking about electronic payments and that mandate going into effect in July. So we brought that to the attention of EAC. So, but we don't have um, we don't have Jennifer Ellis or Prit Paul here today. But yes, we can definitely take that back and get clarification. Any other questions? Okay. So I did. Um, I did just want to um, remind folks the um, segue of and discussing the um, um, directive. The October thirty one directive has been um, shared. It's in your packet. Just again for um, folks who may have missed it. Um, I did want to note that the calendar for 2020 is included on um, today's agenda. Um, and it, again, includes four meetings. Um, I wanted to bring to everyone's attention the November 10th meeting is, in fact, the day before Veterans Day. That's just something for folks to be aware of. Um, and all of those meetings in 2020 will be hosted at CalPERS. Um, and then um, I did want to go through the agenda um, we have included in the packet proposed agenda for February 2020 meeting. Um, one thing that's missing on this agenda I wanted to bring to folks' attention is an employer training module. That is something we've been trying to incorporate over the last year. So um, that's something that um, we are working on and um, it's not reflected in the agenda that's included. Are there any additions or changes folks would like to see for February? All right. Well, I think that um, concludes um, our CAC for today. Um, we wish everyone a um, happy and safe holiday, and we will see everyone in 2020 on the other side of the river. <laughs>